Hello, my name is Rachel Kite and I'm the Dean of the Fletcher School. I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in person. We are extraordinarily excited to have you participating in the Strategic Leadership and Transformative Action Programme. And we are deeply honoured to be able to bring our resources and our view of the world together with Faith's view of transformation within the Greek Orthodox community. Whether you are a member of the clergy or whether you are a lay member uh, of this community, you are very welcome here. And I hope that this program will allow you to explore how you can use the principles rooted in your faith and the leadership that comes from that in a way that can continue to bend the arc of history towards justice. How we can make this world a fairer, uh, and healthier place for everyone. We have a program here on religion, law and diplomacy. How these three tenets of our current Western world interact is a very important part of understanding where we've come from and a very important way of understanding how we can move forward. We have a global economy which is more exclusive or less inclusive than at any time in modern human history. We have a global economy which is being run to the destruction of the planet. We have a global economy which is allowing and which some may argue even incentivizes war and destruction. How do we bring leaders into the world to change those trends and how do we do it over the next two to three decades? What makes this moment in our human history different from others where we have faced existential crisis is that we are running out of time. How do we, as people of faith, think about leadership at a moment where time is no longer on our side? No leader, whether elected, whether appointed, uh, whether just assuming leadership through conflict or through disintegration, has ever made a decision to do something difficult, decision A over decision B, just on the basis of evidence or data alone. Rarely has a decision been made by a leader that just engaged the brain. Most leadership decisions come from the interaction between the brain and the heart. It is emotion that will often spur a decision, even with evidence and data at hand. Therefore, the role of faith-based organizations, of faiths and of people of faith, in helping the world make the decisions that it needs to make has never been more important. You are able to unite the head and the heart and the soul in a way that others may not be able to. You can bring the soul into a soulless discussion. You can perhaps root leaders and root your own leadership, your feet on the ground, your head hopefully in people's aspirations and ambitions. Part of my heritage is Welsh and in our tradition we always say that poets should be our leaders because everything that they speak has to come through their heart first. And I think of this when I look at the elected leaders that we're putting in charge of our economies at this point in time, locally, regionally and nationally. Look at the United States, look at the United Kingdom, looking at India, looking at China, Australia, Brazil, countries with real leadership challenges and real challenges for leaders. Where does the faith-based organization, where does the faith fit in? Before I came to the Fletcher School, I was working on issues of climate change and sustainable energy and access to the resources that economies would need to move forward more sustainably. We worked specifically and in a targeted way with faith-based organizations because for them, sustainability wasn't an issue of sacrifice, of giving something up so that we could have a cleaner world. It was a question of where does light 
and what does light mean in our world? What does the concept of, for example, having access to energy mean for a faith-based organisation? And why would we want to extend that to people who don't have access to clean, reliable and affordable energy? It was specifically working through faith-based organisations that we could talk about the divestment necessary in the pension holdings and in the um, other investment holdings of faith organisations, including churches, including the Vatican, and talk about what the morality as well as the financial health of those decisions meant. Working with the Greek Orthodox Church, with other Protestant churches, with the Catholic Church, with Hindu uh, organizations, with Buddhist organizations, with Islamic organizations around the world, and with Ju Jewish organizations around the world, we were able to build an interfaith dialogue about what sustainability and sustainable energy would mean. But the most important part of all of that work for me was that as faith-based organizations, you could speak about these issues from an economic point of view, from a financial point of view, from a moral point of view, from an ethical point of view, and from a spiritual point of view, that brought a leadership discussion in the round. We were able to have a comprehensive 360 degree understanding of what it meant to be a leader today in the energy sector, in the investment sector, in banking, in the United Nations, elsewhere. So I hope that here, as part of this program, you are prepared to and understand that we will want you to step out of your comfort zone and look at leadership in all of its aspects as you look at applying that leadership to the current challenges the world faces. We face existential challenges today, as well as the run-of-mill challenges of making sure that our economies are working, that we are protected, that we are at peace, and that we can move forward, that everybody's voice is heard in a democracy. The existential challenges are those of nuclear proliferation, always at the back of our mind, but moving forward again at the moment. The possibility of a biohazard, either bioterrorism or another disease jumping from the animal world to the human species and threatening us in a way that uh, would be an existential threat. So a zoonotic disease, as we call them, affecting us on a scale that we haven't seen before. Climate change is an existential threat. It is a threat to the cultures and traditions of those island nations which may disappear or may be uninhabitable within a decade. It's also an existential threat to the people living in cities in Europe and Asia and Africa as well as the United States where heat intensity in the summer becomes unbearable, where forest fires uh, destroy the economy and households and lives. It is an existential threat to the people living on coasts where sea level rise is uh, already transforming the economy and the habit uh, how habitable the coast is, but it's also threatening uh, through a possible uh, risk of uh, a major dislocation in the f uh, oceans of actually whole cities having to relocate. So it's an existential threat. So biohazard, nuclear proliferation, climate change, cybercrime is also, I think, an existential threat, the way to manipulate our computer-based lives um, and instigate uh, war and violence as a result. This is something which is creeping up towards the threshold of existential threat. Here at the Fletcher School we hope that these existential threats can be taught across our curriculum as we focus on the rule of law and how to understand how international law helps us through this complicated world as we seek to understand the international organisations that we need in order to help communities and countries work together to face these threats. As we understand what human security means today and with more people on the move than ever before, how do we uh, protect the rights of everyone? Uh, how do we think about the refugee, the internally displaced person alongside those that have been on the land for many centuries, how do we understand and create the space for those to live together? In each of these areas we're talking about law, we're talking about organisational structure, we're talking about diplomacy and how countries and citizens work together, we're talking about the health of parliamentary and presidential politics, 
we are talking about the rules and the science behind global health and behind global climate change, but we're actually talking about love. We're talking about creating the space within our organizations, within our laws, and within our precedents for us to be able to hold the migrant alongside the settled community, to be able to hold the island nation whose culture will disappear within a decade alongside those whose pollution unwittingly over the last hundred years caused this problem. There is space in international relations for justice, it is the foundation upon which we have built these modern institutions. But there is space for love as well. And as leaders from a faith-based tradition, I hope you'll be able to explore that element of leadership. Each one of you has been on a leadership journey that has brought you here today. Each one of you will have succeeded at times and have failed at others. I've certainly succeeded at times and failed miserably at others. Being able to understand and learn from failure is one of the true hallmarks of a great leader. Humility in a world where it feels like everyone is just shouting louder is, I think, a precious concept to hold on to. And of course, in your faith tradition, in all the Abrahamic faith traditions, the teaching around humility is fundamental to who we are. I hope that you will be able to explore how you can hold on to humility and be a great leader in your community, stand on the shoulders of your community and be a leader in a broader world and how together you can ensure that your faith tradition is able to keep your city, your community and your country moving forward with humility. Alongside humility is the ever-present question of integrity or authenticity. If we look at the leaders today that we respect, it is that there is something authentic about them. That is in part their humility, it is in part their self-recognition, their knowing of themselves, it is in part their willingness to listen as well as to speak. It is uh, bringing the whole self forward. I think learning to be an authentic leader is one thing, but for me, the hardest thing is having the courage to be an authentic leader. Because to be an authentic leader, you are putting yourself out there in a world where everybody's screaming, where social media means that you can be ripped to shreds by somebody who's never met you, doesn't even know what you really think, may not have even read past the headline. For women, for minorities, for people with a disability, for the most vulnerable in our society, their authentic leadership is incredibly powerful and we see more of them being able to come forward. But the risk that, that they take, the extraordinary bravery it takes to stand up and speak out in this world of incredible narcissism and incredible personal attack on the basis of distance, not familiarity, is, I think, something that we should hold on to. Finding the strength to be a leader, an authentic leader today, is not something that I take lightly. Finding the strength to help others be that is extraordinarily important. And then making sure that we don't fall back into the sort of uh, safe space of being able to criticize too easily, of being pulled into the mob appeal of critique and constant critique, I think is also important. Taking a pause, breathing out for six seconds and then in for four before we speak, before we hit send, before we send the tweet, before we take the photo on Instagram. These are the modern challenges to our own authentic leadership. And exploring that alongside uh, your perspectives and your views of the world, of the big issues of our time. Um, small lives are lived with big issues. It is the people in your congregation. It is the people that work alongside you. 
and understanding their challenges in the global context and understanding the global context in their challenges. This is somewhere where you can practice your authentic leadership. The organisations that we use to rule the world, to manage the world, to set the agenda for the world, are a reflection of who we have been over the last 70 years, last 100 years. They are still too male dominated. They are still too European in their concept. Here at the Fletcher School, we teach international relations, but far too often from the perspective of men coming of European descent. And this is something that is a challenge to us as a school. So how do you hold on to that which is good of the past and then refresh it with that which is new and interesting about our own modern discovery and how do you incorporate that into your leadership journey? These are, I think, important questions for you too. Working with young people here and thinking about my own leadership journey and those failures as well as those successes, I often say to the students here is do not think about it as a line. Do not think of it as an unbroken, upwardly uh, moving line. Think of it as jagged with possibility for descent as well as ascent. And it is in those moments where you feel all alone, where you are embarrassed, ashamed, you feel silly, you have made a mistake, or maybe uh, the world has conspired against you to stop you from being able to move forward, perhaps through no fault of your own. It's in those moments, it's in those moments which feel very isolated and feel quite dark. It is in those moments where the real learning comes. Building the space for people who are running around the world, running around their community, leading, 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 building the space for them to be able to reflect upon that, whether it's in their faith, whether it's in an organisation, whether it's in a community, is very important. And in some ways, I think that as a leader, the most important thing we can do sometimes is just hold the door open, is just hold the space open for reflection. In a world that seems to be going at breakneck speed, is that still small voice of calm, again, something which brings us all together in faith traditions? That concept exists in all the Abrahamic traditions, but also exists in Eastern traditions. Is building the space for the sm still small voice of calm to be heard our greatest contribution as leaders? Perhaps. Something, again, for you to reflect on. I'm just deeply honoured that the place where you will come to reflect on your leadership journeys and the way in which you will work as a community to make this world a better place is the Fletcher School. The Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, a school where half of our students come from countries around the world and half come from the United States of America. A, country, uh, a community, a scholarship community committed to a globalist view, a scholarship community committed to asking the difficult questions, to building the new institutions, to moving the world forward, based on an understanding of, uh, of how we can work together and how we could work together better. Um, I hope that you are not just the first and last cohort. I hope that you find something here in your time at Fletcher which will burnish your own already outstanding leadership, that you will derive strength from each other and from this space, and that you will consider Fletcher your intellectual home uh, for years to come. Thank you very much.